afternoon. My name is Hannah Mühlenhoff. I am Assistant Professor of European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. I would like to welcome you to this debate on building feminist peace, what way forward to the EU, uh, for the EU question mark. And today's uh, debate presents actually the final discussion in our series of events on a feminist EU in the world. Um, and I've organized this series with my colleagues Pura Cebulak and Lara Talsma within the ACES Gender and Sexuality in European Geopolitics lecture series. And we started this conversation, I think it was in November, was taking stock of the use approach to gender in its external relations, and also was reflecting on the possibility and the desirability of the European Union um, adopting a feminist foreign policy. And we've discussed these questions together with um, scholars, but also with policymakers and practitioners. And we have scrutinized a feminist, form for, a feminist approach to climate change, for instance, in, in January, but also to trade policy. And um, we have discussed kind of the chances and the pitfalls of a feminist foreign policy, what this term would actually also mean and what this would entail, the politics of knowledge production behind it, the tensions, also the contestations, also within EU institutions, but also within civil society. We've discussed the roles of civil society, but also the role of court, courts in bringing about more just policies in different spheres, such as security, climate change, and trade. Um, and today, together with our panelists, um, who I'm very excited uh, to have here, um, with our panelists who are scholars and practitioners, but also many of them both, um, we want to center the idea of feminist peace. And we want to reflect on new ways forward for the European Union as a peace builder. And these questions, while they're unfortunately always topical, could not actually be more timely these days. And um, here I would like to acknowledge the ongoing violence, mainly against Palestinians by the Israeli state going on right now. And I would like to clarify that we will indeed touch upon this role as a peace builder in Palestine and Israel today. Although our conversation will begin with a broader discussion of feminist peace and feminist peace building, and we will draw on different examples. But let me now finally turn to our speakers for today. Um, and I would like to welcome our three excellent panelists. Thank you so much for sharing, for agreeing to sharing your thoughts with us today and your expertise. Um, so let me begin by introducing Laura Davis. Laura is Senior Associate for Gender, Peace and Security at the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office with an independent civil society platform of European NGOs, NGO networks and think tanks working on peacebuilding and conflict prevention. Laura is also a Senior Consultant on Gender and Political Economy Analysis and Transitional Justice. She's based in Uganda and after well, after a decade of working in and on Central Africa and the Middle East, uh, which she's an expert on. And in 2014, she published her book on EU foreign policy, transitional justice and mediation with Routledge. Laura, thanks for being here. Um, then I would like to introduce to you Gina Hiscott. She's professor at the School of Law at SOAS University of London. Uh, she's a feminist scholar working at the Center for Gender Studies and the School of Law at Source. She has published widely on women, peace and security and the gender justifications for the use of force. She is the author of The Law and the Use of Force of Feminist Analysis with Routledge, Feminist Dialogues on International Law with Oxford University Press. And she's also a co-editor co of The Law of War and Peace Gender Analysis published last year with Z. Thanks, Gita, for, for being here and uh, sharing your expertise with us today. And then I would also like to um, introduce Helen Kezinoa. She's executive director of the Women's International Peace Center in Uganda. Her research interests focus on women's peace efforts, women's participation in peace building and post-conflict reconstruction, um, documented women, girls, refugee experiences, and gender and humanitarian response. She's currently researching grassroots women's peace efforts in South Sudan and gender and post conflict re reconstruction in Northern Uganda. She's also a member of PEMWISE Africa, the U Uganda Technical Working Group on the National Action Plan for the Implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, and a board member of the Women Human Rights Defenders Network in Uganda. She is also a visiting fellow at the Center for Women, Peace and Security at the London School of Economics. 
thank you to Helen and to all three of you for, for being here today. And I think we, we are really looking forward to it, to really um, good discussion. And I would like to start with a very kind of broad opening and difficult um, question. And this is the question that's also, yeah, it's, it's in our title for today. And the question is, what is actually feminist peace? And what should and does feminist peace building entail? And I would like to turn first to Helen to, to hear how she would define feminist peace. Could you unmute yourself? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Hannah, for the introductions. And thank you for inviting me to this space. Um, uh, as an African feminist, uh, feminist peace building is one of the areas that I really want, you know, like to discuss, interrogate uh, myself, interrogate in terms of our practice of peace building. Uh, from what uh, we've done recently and from my own work, um, I would say that feminist peace entails actions within the peace building spectrum that are transformative and lead to sustainable peace. Uh, so the question would be, what do you mean by transformative peace or transformation or sustainable peace? Um, so feminist peace, we then mean that you have to challenge uh, power, patriarchy, uh, but also militarization of peace building. Uh, and I'm glad that around this conversation, we are going to be talking a lot about uh, militarization. Uh, feminist peace promotes individual and institutional feminist approaches. Uh, and of course, this will include well-being, self-care, um, but also at organizational level for institutions that are building peace, that practices respective and inclusive peace building uh, processes and leadership within peace building. Um, peace, feminist peace building should deliver gender just, um, gender justice, uh, you know, for women who have been impacted by conflict. It should demilitarize security and challenge social norms uh, that perpetuate inequality uh, and, and including interrogating the root causes of conflict. It should promote uh, the the importance of incorporating the needs of women uh, within uh, responses um, to peace building, but within that response to recognize the diversities of women and, and people who, who are impacted by conflict. And the fact that their needs are different, uh, but how do you incorporate this in your responses? So feminist peace building will therefore highlight the gendered impact and nature of war itself and apply intersectional analysis in terms of the practice of peace building. Um, it calls for the agency of women, but being conscious not to essentialize the agency of women, uh, because many times that's what happens. Uh, but, but taking this into account within the different uh, post-conflict reconstruction processes, political, uh, peace building, social, economic, and recovery processes, and take into account the fact that uh, the diversities of women could also depend on their, on their histories of colonialism, neoliberalism, and the practices of global economic uh, you know, impact of what post-conflict reconstruction looks like. Uh, but finally, the fact that um, peace building, feminist peace building should ensure disarmament, reduction of military expenditure, and restrictions on arms production to ensure the protection of civilians. And I think when we talk about this, you, it, it makes sense if we at the end begin to interrogate what is happening, like you said, right now between Israel and Palestine. You know, that any intervention um, around that should look at this aspect that we are seeing how the most powerful, the richer, those who are better armed, are, are, are using you know, the, the, the weapons to, to, to eliminate, to cleanse off a particular uh, group of people. So feminist peace finally then interrogates how this kind of militarized um, uh, nature of war 
um, impacts on women and having that discussion in terms of what should be done then to prevent this you know, from happening. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Helen. I think that already touched upon a lot of important things and, and you especially emphasized also militarism, which I think we'll, we'll talk about more as well. Um, Laura, do you want to also uh, jump in? Yes, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, thank you for the invitation and also for the opportunity to have a discussion with uh, Helen and Gina. And, um, you know, I couldn't agree more with what Helen has said. Um, and so perhaps I'd like to develop a couple of sort of related points. And I think that um, a lot of the discussions that I hear around feminist peace and feminist peace building is, oh, is this just another example of feminist on the front of something because it's kind of trendy and it's a bit like you know getting more women in boardrooms of you know multinationals without actually really thinking about you know what feminism might mean in those environments and I think that the answer for me boils down to a similar discussion that was had around you know conflict sensitive development aid um, if conflict if development aid is good it is by definition conflict sensitive and so the feminist for me in both peace and peace building is unnecessary in principle. But of course, sadly, in practice, it's extremely necessary because of um, both the way in which we imagine peace and also the ways in which we work to get there. And so I think very similarly to how Helen has described it, I think of a feminist um, peace building or feminism as being useful for peace building in two ways. Firstly, as an analytical tool, the way of thinking, and secondly, as a way of acting. Um, now, I also think that, you know, for a start, we, that is, you know, people in general, have so internalized and normalized the suppression of vast swathes of our populations on, you know, completely spurious grounds, whether it be gender, sexuality race, religion, uh, socioeconomic class, all of these things, that kind of marginalization that which is a social construct, it is a man-made construct, um, has become so internalized that feminism can help us to identify them. Now, you know, I'm a white European feminist, I am conscious that feminism has its many failings, it is a work in progress, but hopefully as feminism develops, it will be able to shed more light on these structures of inclusion, inclusion and exclusion of privilege and, um, and uh, um, marginalization, so to say, um, and can help us identify these because these lead to structural violence, which is bad enough as in itself, but structural violence is also a prerequisite for violent conflict, which is generally the purview of the peace builder. And so I think that one of the ways in which we can, um, uh, feminism can, make peace building better is by understanding these structural these, the importance of structural violence which I think is generally overlooked and downplayed within peace building in general um, as a field um, but also to interrogate what we mean by peace to actually enable allow us to have a radical rethinking of how societies need to be reorganized and reconstructed after the event um, in order to create peace. So if we can think of peace as being feminist and in the ways that, that Helen described, which is you know, a redistribution of, in, in my, my phraseology, I'd put it as redistribution of access to resources and, and, and the demilitarization, she talked about the reduction of violence, greater inclusion. Um, that I think can also help us then in our method. Now we're going to come later to how we act. Um, but it seems to me that those are the two main things. And that if we then take a case where, you know, normally you can't get two people to agree on actually what they mean by peace. And, and it's an ideal, it's an objective to which we're all striving. Um, this helps us break it down. But I think it also helps to sometimes question, and again, you know, this might be where, um, might be of relevance to uh, what is going on in um, Israel, Palestine at the moment is that where peace building is actually not appropriate or not possible because the peace that's on offer is so heavily patriarchal or heavily exclusive that in fact it's not peace at all and that by using this misnomer of peace building we're actually doing far more harm than good and actually straying far away from the kind of feminist principles that i would see at the heart of any peaceful uh, peaceful resolution um, 
And then we should, we should probably be talking about a different form of feminism, feminist resistance, for example. So I would say then that it is both the analytical tool, um, which I think we've talked about, but also then a way of acting and a way of being in the world, which I would think we'll come to later. So thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Gina, what would you like to, to add or <laughs> emphasize? Uh, I feel like I shouldn't have gone last. Wow, Laura and Helen, such a comprehensive uh, kind of conversation that we started. And thank you so much, Hannah, for the invitation um, to join you in the conversation today. Um, yeah, I think um, probably everything that Helen and Laura said, and then I guess my perspectives are kind of more from an active academic point of view, the thing that I sort of came here thinking about this question was about the internal and the external elements of feminist peace or what we might mean by feminist maybe picks up on what Laura was saying about the feminist element of feminist peace being a methodology um, and then that that's something that constructs the feminist communities that we belong to um, but then also has an element of external critique of peace building and peace practices in and of themselves and I think there's something to be thought through about that kind of internal project of how we organize feminist peace within our feminist spaces, uh, which also taps on, I think, what Helen said much better than I can about the role of difference and kind of risks of essentialism, but also projects of, you know, once you open the door to talking about women, how do we open kind of further doors and further spaces of inclusion beyond that. Um, and for me, I think this is, I suspect we'll keep coming back to um, perhaps a kind of roadblock again and again that the structural dimensions of this mean a rethinking of how the kind of knowledges that we come uh, to um, spaces of organizing institutions with so the external critique in this instance thinking about EU policies or spaces of peace building um, the kind of tools that Laura was talking about, thinking about violence as a continuum, thinking about the human dimensions of security, thinking about gender-based violence, gender justice. Um, feminist peace brings those two uh, mainstream institutions and structures, um, but without thinking about the internal dimensions of how feminists organize themselves and organize their own ways for speaking, I think what we come up against is the what Laura kind of ended on talking about the way that institutions themselves re-emerge through gender projects as asserting their own agenda rather than the gender agenda. So that I think there's a commitment to an internal critique about um, thinking about what has been achieved, particularly around spaces such as women, peace and security or gender justice in peace building to ask what happens next, kind of owning and seeing those successes and also then thinking what we learn from them because of what gets consolidated by them. So the internal feminist praxis for me is that a continued process of undoing assumed knowledge Practices and attention to the risks of, I guess, co-optation into those knowledge practices. Uh, and that, that praxis for me sits at the heart of feminist peace in the sense of uh, this is never, a, we've arrived, we've got a policy, we've got a law, but then asking what work that's doing both to transform and to reinforce uh, the status quo. Um, but I, yeah, I think Laura and Helen probably gave a, a great kind of start for us. Thank you. Great, um, thank you. I mean, I think you are you are touching upon also this idea, you know, um, the importance maybe of feminist resistance, as Laura put it, or um, internal, you've got internal, external, internal peace um, building, or internal feminist feminist activism. Um, so this brings me a little bit also to to my next question, which is the role of the women peace and security agenda. I mean, we've, you already mentioned kind of the take cooptation of peace building. You know, maybe there's you know there's patriarchal peace building uh, in, in most most cases. So we, that's where you're putting the feminist in, in front of this. Um, how what is the potential of the women peace and security agenda to as a tool for feminist peace building? Um, and I'm also wondering that it has the word peace in its name, but it's also often very much tied to security policy. I think it's something that we'll also talk about. How, what is the potential really for, for the World Peace and Security Agenda also in the, you know, connecting this to the ideas of feminist 
resistance and activism um, within feminist peace. And I think I will already kick it back to Gina again uh, to, to respond to that question. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so I think I can give an overview of kind of WPS and my thoughts on it. I think always you have to start by celebrating the footholds and thinking about, you know, this is something that we've had in the Security Council space since 2000 and the tremendous work uh, that is just that preceded that to, to, to put WPS, to put 1325 on the books and the work that goes on both within those institutional spaces and well outside of that. And if we see it as footholds, which is, of course, not my language, is the language that Diane Otto used to describe uh, 1325 some time ago. Uh, once we see it as footholds, then we see it as a, as a dynamic process of what do we do next? What, how, what other transform, transformations can we make uh, alongside this? Uh, and part of that for me, I guess, as an international lawyer is thinking about what gender law reform looks like once it becomes law, uh, what projects as feminists we might have that have nothing to do with law, what can we achieve in completely different spaces because there are kind of the risks of the kind of institutionalization there. Um, but the other thing that I love to think about is that the kind of many misreadings of the Women, Peace and Security uh, resolutions and their agenda by feminist networks and how they've been strategically used in so many different contexts. Um, my favorite ones when my students are here is always to think about how uh, Femlink in the Pacific uh, use the language of WPS to build ra women's radio networks. There's nothing about radio networks in WPS and I, and I think the the work of Wilf in translating the resolutions into so many different languages allows these to be tools to speak to power, perhaps go back to the points around resistance and different types of resistance, local women's networks and organizing, I think also seeing into regional women's networks um, and the work that they've done uh, through different regional women's networks uh, that, are, that is often lost because we look at it through the lens of states uh, as well. So for me, uh, WPS is, series of footholds, uh, beginning points, interventions that we need to use to make further interventions uh, into peace and security, whether it's peace or security, but also opportunities uh, for strategic misreadings of existing law. And what I mean by that is uh, particularly international law and soft laws as they are, these are, are open to kind of all different types of interpretations and making them real in specific contexts, I think is what we've seen is the, the moment to celebrate. Uh, of course, if you've read my stuff, then I actually also think there's lots to pick apart in, in asking what gets solidified here that reinforces certain the gender binary, that the focus of gender always being on women, uh, the kind of failures in terms of addressing militarization and, and military masculinities. So I'll pass it on. Thank you. Um, Helen, do you want to continue maybe to think to yeah, your thoughts on the suitability of the one piece and security agenda, also the usefulness for your for um, your work um, and the work of your organization as well. Yeah, I would say um, if, if the WPS agenda is a feminist tool, I would say yes and no. <laughs> um, and I would just, you know, keep talking about why yes and why no, um, as, as I explained. The first is, um, you know, what's, what Gina was saying that the, the, the WPS has provided us with an opportunity uh, to address, you know, the, the, the war impact on women, you know, respond to those needs, advocate for issues, calling on governments in terms of participation, protection, prevention. Uh, so it kind of gives us like um, a framework, a, a backbone in terms of our advocacy you know, for the, for the different pillars of 1325. Even though, you know, like Gina said, that the content and the provisions of the WPS agendas, I think 10 of them now, is subject to varied interpretations. Um, interpretations by the UN, interpretations by governments and states, and interpretation by activists, you know, in the different fields uh, of peace building. Uh, but as feminists, I think that we look at the gaps, you know, that the WPS have, and then use those gaps uh, to begin to point to alternatives uh, that are not provided within the WPS agenda. So, for example, there's a lot of focus on sexual and gender-based violence. Yes, it is very important, 
But paying attention to that also leaves out other aspects, you know, that, in, that has a relationship with, with violence against women, issues of um, um, economic hardship, you know, social hardships, um, a, a loss of property, reduction of, you know, um, access to food and the rest, uh, which also has an implication, you know, for, for, for violence against women in conflict situations. Leaving aspects of women's on, on, on paid care work, uh, the fact that the, the care work for women increased during conflict, the WPS doesn't talk about it, but it allows us as we interrogate this to bring those conversations on board. That you can't talk about sexual violence without talking about economic empowerment for women. You can't, you know, you can't talk about um, uh, participation without talking about economic empowerment for women uh, and the extra work that they do and how that prevents them from participation. So it enables us to interrogate these pillars, but bring in our feminist analysis that then enables us to advocate for those aspects that are missing within the WPS. It, it, it also uh, helped us to interrogate and make linkage between violence or conflict-related sexual violence and militarism, you know, and question the practice of UN peacekeepers, for example, and how their interventions in conflict situations increases violence against women. The fact that they rape women, you know, in the process of peacekeeping, you know, is something that, you know, we then also bring into the debate in terms of holding states accountable. But um, it, it doesn't talk about women's bodily integrity a lot, you know, in terms of what does that mean in humanitarian setting, what is provided, uh, uh, menstrual um, kits for women who are fleeing conflict, but we bring it in you know, in terms of our own feminist analysis. So I'm just emphasizing the fact that it, it, it is a useful tool because it enables feminist analysis that then allows us to identify the gaps and kind of see how we co-opt it into the conversation uh, and come for uh, accountability. But, but it's recently, the most recent ones of 2019, I think 2147 and 2106, those two resolutions then begin to talk about um, treaties, you know, and, you know, and all those things that then also enables us as feminist peacekeepers to begin to interrogate how, you know, the, the, the Western world um, invests so much in armed production, calling for, you know, name and shame armed producers who are investing in arms and, you know, so if we didn't have it, probably we wouldn't have the opportunity to have the conversation. So I think it's a useful tool uh, that enables us to, 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 to analyze and, um, and, and advocate for those. Um, even with his uh, lapses, I would say, for example, in the South Sudan Peace Agreement, that they were able to, to, to smuggle in 35% you know, affirmative action for women in terms of participation. Um, it is there, it is there. It is not being respected, but it's giving us an opportunity to, to have a campaign on 35% affirmative action, even though we know we need to go deeper in terms of our feminist analysis to question why aren't we getting up to 35% of women? Because there's no education, because um, um, for you to be given a position, you need to belong to a political party. And yet political parties do not have gender policies and they don't have any mechanism to recruit more women into the political space. So once we get into those deeper conversations to question the practices, it then enables us to see further what we can do, you know, in terms of improving um, the women, peace and security agenda from a feminist perspective. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Um, I would now like to, to ask Laura um, for her view, um, especially also in relation to the European Union uh, and, and uh, the women, peace and security agenda in that context of peace building. So um, thank you very much. So I'm going to focus really on the European uh, strategic approach to WPS, which is the latest EU policy on um, w in support of the WPS agenda, which was adopted in 2019. Um, and it's a marked improvement from the previous policy, which was the comprehensive approach to support uh, 1325 of sort of 10 years earlier. Um, is it a good tool? Um, yes and no, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, for many of the reasons that have already been talked about. Um, but, you know, to be honest, as has also been said, it's pretty much, it's pretty much the only one we've got. 
Um, now, the strategic approach itself is a really good document, I think. I don't think we could have asked for better. Um, and the cynic will say that maybe it wasn't read so closely. Uh, there is also a provision in there, of course, for round arms trade treaty, which made me think, makes me think that some of the larger arms producers, uh, members of the EU, didn't quite read that page. But anyway, never mind. They agreed it. They passed it. So um, the challenge is always going to be an implementation in two ways. Now, WPS policy within the EU and within many of its member states has always been very carefully siloed away from anything important, right? So there's been a nice little box called WPS and things have happened within it. But it hasn't affected how the EU sees itself in the world. It hasn't affected any of the major policy areas. Um, you know, as you said in your introduction, we talk about women, peace and security. But in fact, we're actually talking usually about women and security. Uh, and that's certainly true within the, the EU. Um, and if we I think we can look at sort of the, the, the broader level and I want to look at some of the process questions as well. So when the strategy was adopted, it had a pretty consultative of process, bearing in mind there was no money, uh, no resources actually made available to do it, um, but only of civil society within Europe. So um, women's associations and experts from civil society were invited and academics were invited to comment uh, and to, um, to extensively uh, input on the draft, but not a single person from outside the European Union, uh, which already points to, you know, a very serious, it's not only a failing in in process, but it's also a indicative, I think, of mentality. Uh, the second is that um, uh, despite the fact that consultation with civil society is such an important part of the whole WPS agenda, um, the first thing that happened after the strategic approach was adopted was the civil society was dropped from regular participation in the task force, which is the space in which this is uh, in which this is discussed and progress and so on and so forth. So even on the level of consultation, you know, there's there's some good parts and there's some serious uh, shortcomings. But um, and then if we look at the stuff, perhaps the the easy the easy bits to achieve how the EU manages within its own institutions, where it has the power to do what it wants to do, basically. If we look at the appointments, the senior appointments that have been made since the current High Representative Borrell has taken position, they are all men. So the gender balance within the senior management, within the senior echelons of the External Action Service is, has, has completely changed in only two years. Um, and this is something which can be easily fixed. This is a question of deciding that that is what you're going to do. If we look at the post for principal advisor, the principal advisor on gender to the, to the EU, um, Ambassador Maranaki, her post came to an end at the end of last year. She was the one who drove through the revision of the, um, the strategic approach. And then the post stayed open for, um, for a long, for many months. And it was only really, as far as I can see, from the insistence and the, in, in, uh, in, uh, the involvement of the European Parliament, led by Hannah Neumann MP, MP, MEP, um, that actually got the post filled. And when the post was filled, it, there is now a question, a, there was a lot of question about its seniority, but it is now also the advisor position for uh, gender and diversity. Now, diversity is an extremely important portfolio, is a vital portfolio. Um, and I'm sure that we're all aware of the Brussels So White campaign. I mean, the, the, the level of whiteness within the EU institutions is quite extraordinary. However, these are two different portfolios. These are two different jobs that require different skill sets and different sets of resources. They can't just be bundled into one, you know, to tick all the boxes. So, you know, very supportive of the new incumbent. I don't know, I'm looking forward to seeing what her plans will be. Um, but the post in itself uh, has already been set up uh, as uh, problematically. So, these are, in a way, these are very small examples, but I think at the small examples, particularly where nobody can contest the ability to actually make those decisions, uh, are rather indicative of the broader. As, um, as, uh, as, as, uh, as Gina started off by saying, you know, it was in, when, didn't start off by saying, but as, as Gina was talking about, the importance of this document really is the footholds um, for us. It provides the language. 
Um, it provides uh, it provides a policy which has been agreed, which is, we may well be cheerfully ignored as previous uh, as the previous document was as well. But in principle, the WPS strat strategic approach should apply to all levels of ex EU external action, including counterterrorism, including preventing and countering violent extremism, mm -hmm. including migration. Um, and so it could it should cover the whole swathe. And this is basically where we will be focusing our efforts over the the next years. It also gives us a critical entry point, which is gender analysis, to require external action to have gender analysis. Astonishingly, this is not actually a requirement. Um, we now see that at the moment, uh, the, the European Parliament has also just forced for the new programme, um, the Ndiki uh, programme, the new funding instrument of the European Union for External Action Service, must have a uh, conflict analysis, again, as a requirement to intervene. Um, and what we will be looking at again is, the, is, is to what extent that does have gender analysis provisions within it, but to what extent these are meaningfully and robustly carried out. And crucially, of course, it will involve it will our test of this will a test of implementation will also include the extent to which women's associations, women's leaders, and inclusive civil society are engaged in all of the development of the country action programs, of the gender analysis in different scenarios, particularly, and of course, you know, from a peace building point of view, particularly in situations of conflict, mm -hmm. to the extent to which that these uh, associations are engaged in a meaningful consultation. And by that, not just rounding everybody up and having a document drawing up, you know, the voice of, you know, as the documents we've all seen, the voice of the women of South Kivu, as though they all have the same view about anything. And we have to see the extent to which those voices are, 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 are sought out. It's not about being heard, it's about being sought out in the beginning and provided with an open agenda, not a closed agenda, to actually tell policymakers what they should be doing, not vice versa, not, you're right, you know, our priority, um, as Helen was talking about, you know, our priority is sexual violence. That is the central theme, of course, there are also others. Um, one big failing, um, one serious failing of the, the strategy, of course, is that it uh, does not, despite attempts to get uh, explicit references into LGBTIQ um, activists and additional protection, um, that it, the LGBTIQ is completely absent from the strategy. Um, and the best that we could do, in terms of the best we could achieve was to have gender identities in its plural included in the language. Um, this despite the fact that, of course, the council has guidelines on um, the promotion of LGBTIQ rights worldwide, which of course, all delegations are supposed to, um, supposed to implement, but uh, many decide that they can choose not to. So another part of this will be to use that language of gender identities and to see to what extent we can push um, that it has a much more inclusive um, understanding of gender identities and, and exactly does not do the harm that you referred to in your, uh, in, in your introduction about this extremely binary um, understanding of women uh, and understanding of women has so often meant um, majority ethnicity, uh, capital city, urban, educated, uh, and usually uh, elite as well. So, and then my final point on this is that what we would want to see and what um, we'll be campaigning for in the, is, is, is how to shift some of the mindset that we see already. So if we read back, so not even getting into the peace and security aspect really, but if we look back at the EU's global strategy, which is ambition for the state of the world, if we look at the language, the gender language throughout that, it is colonial, it is othering, it reduces women outside the European Union to being victims and passive recipients of aid or passive recipients of somebody else's of male radicalization. Um, uh, other men are also reduced either to, um, or um, you know, they're either not present as sort of the omniscient uh, force throughout, or um, especially young men are uh, identified uh, so clearly with, with radicalization and with terrorism as a threat. So what we need to do is to use the WPS agenda, this strategic approach to change this mindset 
um, and to address very severely that this is about, this is to drag it towards what I would hope for in a feminist foreign policy, which is not that the WPS agenda becomes a vehicle to forward the careers of individual white women within the European institutions, but becomes a way of rethinking actually what peace and security mean for women and for men um, and the EU's role for that in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for pointing us to all these very crucial points, I think, in the in the EU's approach to the women, peace and security agenda and things that we really need to discuss uh, in the future. And um, really following up also on, on what also Helen and Gina said and, and, and you, Laura, um, is my next question, which is about the role of different actors really in feminist peace. Um, feminist peace building and you already pointed to the role of civil society, the role of whose knowledge really counts, who is included um, in these processes and um, you, you pointed out how it's in the US been mainly uh, European NGOs that have been included in these processes, and even they have been kicked out of the process. So my question really is also how, what is the role for international actors and specifically for the European Union um, in yeah, in building feminist peace, what what can or what should the EU do, and how can it rely on on really um, yeah the knowledge of the the marginalized, also thinking about the idea of decolonizing peace building, um, decolonizing the work of of peace NGOs, um, and I think we can here kind of tie in two questions that we have from the audience, and the first one is um, from Dimitris Buris, and he's asking what really the difference is between feminist peace and liberal peace. Um, and maybe you can bring this, this into your answer. So what, what, what is really the, yeah, how is, I, I would say feminist peace also challenging liberal peace. So really what are the difference? How can this maybe be also um, brought in? And then the second question comes from uh, Catherine Wright and she asked whether we know why civil society was dropped from the, the task force um, for the women, peace, and security agenda um, in the EU. So um, maybe we'll start with uh, uh, I'll start with Helen, um, and uh, then we'll continue with Gina. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think building on the arguments that um, Laura just uh, posited on, um, you know whose knowledge uh, informs the practice of, of peace building by external actors. It, it, I think one thing that the EU and other external actors should be conscious about is what she also presented, you know, presenting women as, or people who have been affected by conflict as those who are just there sitting and waiting for help to come from, from outside. The fact that, um, the external actors must acknowledge that within uh, conflict situations, people who have been affected by conflict have some agency within themselves and they understand the local context and, and they know what it will take to build peace. So it is very important therefore to first engage with them, uh, find out from them what support is needed and how this support should be, you know, should be given uh, and develop that strategy together as compared to coming in with you know, um, a written strategy already. Uh, so people sitting in Brussels, uh, wherever the EU is located, uh, just sit and said, okay, this is uh, South Sudan, and this is what is happening. I think this is what is needed based on what we know. That local people should be involved you know, in, in developing that you know, to inform and to recognize that um, the fact that there's conflict doesn't mean that they lack the skills and knowledge of what the situation is, what the context is, and then what is needed. So, um, uh, for example, in the case of DRC, the, there was this thing about um, external actors saying that the best thing would be a uh, power sharing arrangement, you know, in terms of peace building, but it didn't work. You know, with all those strategies until now, we still have a conflict in DRC. It has never ended. So, so, so looking at the context, you know, dealing with the, the issues that came, you know, from pre-colonial to post-colonial period uh, would actually inform what is needed to build peace 
but also bringing into interrogation the role that the global economic um, uh, uh, agenda within these conflict situations also play in, 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 in fueling the conflict, you know, for example, in, in, in the DRC itself. Um, and, and, and you cannot talk about um, engaging and building peace without talking to the actors in the conflict um, to be able to find out, you know, and also talking to people living the realities of those conflicts um, to, to ask to find out from them what is needed uh, and, and avoid imposing strategies, you know, in this, in this, in this context. But I think it's also very important for the EU to build local capacities, um, you know, to be able to address insecurities, um, including the UN, instead of sending people to go and do peace building, you know, peacekeeping, is to build local capacities for them to do this by themselves because they know, you know, they know what is happening, um, you know, and, and, and what should be done. But also to find out what is the root, what are the root causes of the conflict? So many times we go, dealing with the, the surface issues about uh, governance, uh, promoting elections and democracy as, as an approach to peace building, it doesn't work. So in, in many ways, uh, during those elections, conflict happens after those elections, many times they are not transparent, you know, uh, and people get more agitated with the process and then it leads to conflict. We've seen what happens in many of the African countries. You know, so, so what is the best approach um, is, is, to, is to discuss with the locals and then come up with, you know, something that would work. Um, in terms of the questions that, that have come up, uh, the difference between feminist peace and liberal peace, I think there's a difference, you know, because while liberal peace it could also be related to liberal feminism itself, um, feminist peace, um, tends to challenge um, and interrogate um, power inequalities and, and uh, focuses on transformation. So dismantling patriarchy itself, but questioning those practices, uh, you know, and the way that peace building is done in a militarized way, um, I think it, it's not very liberal that a lot of the feminist peace activists have been upfront. Um, Gina talked about the work of WILP uh, in terms of um, talking about weapons and this work has been going on since the Second World War, you know, and, and calling out, documenting, you know, these incidences and challenging structures within the United Nations Security Council, addressing them to the issues of armed treaty, addressing them to the issues of uh, weapon production, addressing them and challenging them on the practices of uh, conflict-related sexual violence and what is needed. Uh, the question will be that despite all of these efforts, sexual violence continues. Despite all of these efforts, um, when people are in conflict, they don't listen, you know. So I think feminist peace goes a bit beyond, while some of it looks like liberal peace, I think it also goes beyond that, you know, um, to um, address a more transformative approach. But I think Gina and Laura can talk more about that as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Gina, do you want to chip in? Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Helen. I think um, you're right, they are different projects really. And maybe I, for me, when you were talking about um, how we look into conflicts and decide who's the expert, decide who has the knowledge, liberal I think liberal peace building projects tend to come with the idea that there's a frame of reference that's to be imposed and delivered I think building uh, attempts to undo that sense uh, has a, a understanding of um, peace being varied and and that the experts on what that might look like in a specific context being localized and asking who already is doing the work around peace building in that community um, and then that would open up to questions about plural forms of governance, alternative forms of governance and transitional justice, uh, not a model that's imposed from Europe or European knowledge 
history. So I think I think of them very differently. I think of liberal peace uh, also kind of accommodating a kind of liberal feminism, as you're saying, Helen, underneath that and addressing women's rights through that, uh, addressing women's participation uh, that, but not not undoing gender binaries or histories of uh, patriarchy. So I think that they come quite different things, but great question, Dimitri, so thank you. Um, I was going to sort of respond to this by, th I think, first, what Laura was saying before about uh, you can't have a gender policy in the EU without asking what work gender does in the EU. So it can't be something, again, like liberal peace to be delivered out where, out, elsewhere. You've got to look at who has the positions of power within that organisation. And if you haven't thought about that within your organisation, whether you're an NGO, civil society actor, or, uh, you know, um, a supranational governance space, then there's some questions about what you're going to deliver, because uh, it's going to be the same gender norms that you value within your institution uh, itself. Uh, but the, the main thing I wanted to think about here is what happens in the crisis moment, really so important this week, this day, this month, uh, as we look at what's happening uh, to Palestinian people. Uh, and the EU on Sunday went to the Security Council, struggled to put together a consensus document uh, because of diverse voices around and responses to the conflict. But there is no mention of gender at that point. So how do we square the idea of an EU women, peace and security strategy that speaks about the importance of this at every moment of peace and security? But in that crisis moment, it's not now. Now, this is when we talk about it, but it actually might be a moment of consensus across uh, very di diverse views within that community as well. Uh, and it actually might be one way of breaking some of the stranglehold of the kind of extreme positions. Um, but actually just even more so, we know that crisis moments and that some of the work I've done looking into Security Council resolutions, the ones where you had the most, most prolific responses around women's participation or around conflict related sexual violence within a specific conflict or peace building scenario. If you look at the resolutions or the discussions at the moment when the crisis is happening, when there is the most extreme military violence or there's discussion of an intervention, uh, then there is nothing about gender. Um, and I think that uh, is a huge structural uh, concern uh, that means even if we can bring talking about militarization, if we can talk about the arms trade, it's still going to happen after. It's going to happen in the post-conflict moment. It's not going to be really the origins of peace talks start at, with the origins of the conflict. And if, if gender isn't part of that conversation at that moment, I think that we all will be going in circles for, for you know, and gender will be the add on rather than instrumental to change. Thanks for, for bringing this important point uh, to the discussion. Um, I will also pick um, that up again. Uh, I want to pass on to Laura. Okay, thank you. Uh, so very quickly, the answer about the, uh, obviously I wasn't there uh, because we weren't allowed to be there, but I think I understand the reason is that the task force needs to be able to talk only amongst uh, the members and the institutions um, because Apparently they can't do that with civil society present. So again, you know, a little bit as where Gina ended off is that we'll do it, but only when only when we kind of got time. And then, you know, that's when people are answering their emails or they're leaving the room or whatever anyway. So so that was um, that was why, uh, as I understand it, the um, civil society was dropped from the task force. So on the um, peace building, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> So much has, has been said. And I'd like to just sort of expand a couple of the points uh, that have been made. I think the first is that, um, you know, the European Union also needs, to, I think if, if we're going to talk about peace building in any real sense, is that you kind of have to walk the walk the talk, right, to, to use the cliche. So the first thing is that we do also need to address as Europeans the fact that, you know, in our continent on our continent in our in our union um, is that we are struggling with um, a European created migrant crisis um, which ebbs and flows but is is long running we all have long running conflicts within and now on our borders which are yet to be resolved um, 
And of course, we are struggling desperately with the question of gender equality. And we've seen massive backsliding, not on women's rights and LGBTIQ rights, not only in Hungary and Poland, um, that it's not the only place where these rights are being eroded faster than they can practically be written. Um, but uh, throughout, the, there, are, there are good spots within the continent, absolutely. But there are also some very, very nasty spots. And those are well and truly within the EU. So one of the things that we have to do as European NGOs uh, is to address this at home, right? I mean, that's part of it. So it's the internal as well as the external. The second then um, is about understanding the context. Now, this becomes a bit of a mantra. It becomes um, uh, a, a mantra in the sense that it becomes uh, unintelligible in some ways. Proper analysis, thoughtful analysis, don't do something until you actually understand what the possible consequences of your actions might be and who you might be supporting. So here again, you know, the importance of conflict analysis, understanding conflict. And if you add conflict analysis does not include robust gender analysis, it is not conflict analysis. It's just a bit of paper. It doesn't help you because you will do harm. Right. So that, I think, is the the, um, the the first the first thing, the first part of that. Um, the second uh, part of it is a question about being risk averse. I was going to say um, that the EU should be less risk averse uh, in its to peacemakers and peace builders. Um, but then I thought, actually, in a way, that's nonsense, because when it comes to dealing with governments or people in power or people who are holding guns, um, the EU and its member states are, are spectacularly willing to, adopt, to embrace risk. I mean, in the most cavalier manner possible. I mean, if we look at the way in which they deal with governments of which about whom there is no mystery about what is going on. I mean, we might not know the names of all of the disappeared, but we know that there are, you know, several hundred people missing, for example. Now, you know, if the, the EU and its member states are perfectly happy to deal with these governments, but they're not happy to take a punt on some community based organizations who may actually just make a difference, right? So I think this is part of it. It is about un re, um, re shifting the narrative around risk and risk aversion, because at the moment, the, 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 the risk is all piled in, in spectacularly the, the wrong way. Sorry, I was momentarily distracted because some people came in from school at the same time. Anyway, um, so in addition then to what institutions, and I think this also, these things also apply to, um, um, these also apply to, no, sorry, one of the other things I want to say about understanding is also understanding not only the context of the conflict, but also what else is going on. And here I think that the, some of the uh, trends that we've seen during the COVID pandemic are really concerning. In many places, COVID is not primarily a public health crisis. It may also be, but it may not be primarily a public health crisis. What it is happening in many places is that it is exacerbating existing uh, inequalities and existing drivers of conflict, and it is leading to the wholesale repression of economic, social, political, and cultural rights. And as usual, women and non-conforming gender minorities are bearing the brunt of all of that. So what the EU needs to do, for example, not only in thinking about conflict, but also in thinking about, for example, its response to COVID as there will be presumably some kind of response after uh, a period of basically having no foreign policy at all and just you know the, the shutters coming down once the European Union starts looking abroad it has to understand that Covid and other um, uh, in, for example is not only a public health issue it's not even primarily a public health issue it is also tied to questions of governance and corruption um, and all sorts of things that only by dealing with it in a holistic way in other words understanding the actual context uh, can any intervention on those um, make uh, make make sense. So, what then for um, NGOs activists uh, within within Europe? What should and can we do? First of all, we need to be much better on the whole peace and security front of holding our institutions to account, uh, member state and European. Uh, there are ways of doing it. Uh, we don't use them very much, certainly not at the European level. Uh, there's very interesting moves within the migration um, community who are challenging the use of trust funds, particularly in Libya, 
um, on uh, migration related uh, border security um, at the EU level through the courts. Um, and this is very untested, I think, although I suspect Gina is far more, uh, Gina is far more of an expert on this than me. But in general, we need to be holding our institutions to account, using the parliament, using the courts, using our member states, and of course, lobbying at the member state level. Um, we also need to be aware that within our own lobby and advocacy space, this is also often a racist space in Europe. It is often a very, very white space where people are representing others. We need to fix that. We need to address it. We need to understand it. We need to acknowledge it. We need to get help. People like me need to get help from outside on how to minimize the reproduction of a very closed space in the EU um, advocacy um, space. Uh, advocacy movement. And finally, we need to make sure, because the money is going away, the money is going very, very fast. It's going to be re-diverted to COVID and not necessarily in, um, in a way that would make most sense, as I've just been talking about. Um, the resources for peace building are going to be cut drastically. Evidently, Brexit, which thankfully we've got a long way into this before talking about Brexit, but Brexit has is going to have a, a, an impact because of the reduction in the budget, if nothing else. Um, European resources for peace building are going to be far less, and they are being diverted to what we're going to be talking about next, the so-called peace facility. Um, so what we need to do as NGOs is we need to we need to safeguard those resources and we need to safeguard and we need to hold a space and we need to ensure that feminist peace builders are leading that space. OK, so we need to be operating from within the European Union and to, in support of and led by feminist peace, peace builders outside. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I think this this also leads to my, my next question. So I will try to actually connect two questions in order to a little bit also again reflect on this on the situation in Israel and Palestine that also Gina already started and also move our conversation to the aspect of militarism um, in, in this regard. Um, so I, I would like to invite you to to either kind of yeah reflect on the question what you think the US role should be right now. Um, you've already um, started discussing that the WPS agenda has already been kind of sidelined and it could actually be a tool to, to also find consensus. I think that's a very interesting point. Um, and in this context, also militarism and arms exports that I've also mentioned before play quite a big role um, when it comes to this conflict, but also to other conflicts. And um, more generally, there's been a lot of criticism of states that say they have a feminist foreign policy um, that still export arms. Um, so I want to reflect or discuss a little bit what this feminist position um, on arms exports is and what, how we can challenge or think about militarism um, in, in the context of feminist uh, peacekeeping. Um, Gina, would you maybe like to, to, to reflect on some of these questions? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I think this is when we start to see the limits of WPS as a tool, right? So I think we've been generally positive about it, but when we get to this point, we see there are small insertions, we see that there's 10 resolutions, some of which reiterate the same kind of uh, preoccupations around protection and participation in particular. Um, but some of the interlocking issues, particularly the arms trade, but also thinking about borders and border security and the role of the EU in different types of kind of delivery of the infrastructure for so-called border security. Uh, and just the very, very simple idea of the you know, military force as a solution to problems uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, then the, the WPS agenda doesn't provide solutions, right? Uh, they might provide footholds to be part of some of those conversations, but actually what we're talking about today is that those conversations often uh, are leaving out uh, feminist uh, stakeholders or, or gender experts or, and certainly, and then that even of itself, if we can mobilize that falls back to what Laura was saying about who constitutes uh, feminist and gender justice experts from the perspective of the EU, uh, that's not going to be uh, 
women and feminist networks in conflict spaces, uh, in post-conflict spaces, in conflicts that have achieved some kind of move towards peace. That's where our feminist net <laughs> experts on building peace already exist, uh, but we're looking back into Europe so the knowledge kind of frames uh, are not being undone within the EU. So I think that this is really the moment where we see the problems with the WPS, and we've seen in the last uh, resolution and that the debates around WPS of starting to being um, held um, at the mercy of internal or domestic state uh, politics as well. So the Trump administration shifts from the commitments of the Obama, but even the Bush administration before them. Um, so what we thought was kind of general consensus, you when you have WPS uh, um, sessions in the Security Council, you get more states turning up and saying, kind of speaking the language of WPS than any other issue on the Security Council's agenda. But I think we've seen a shift away from that where it's now, uh, you know, certain things that states are using within WPS to uh, stall kind of any de further developments. So I think for me, this is where you get to the real limits uh, of WPS uh, and you need to look at work that was done um, that's done in other spaces and have a kind of multi-pronged kind of initiative. I think one of the questions also sort of thinks about separate silos of knowledge uh, and actually asking if a feminist idea of peace actually talks also about health, I would talk, add speaks about environmental and climate change. We've raised migration a few times as, as part of a feminist security agenda. Uh, then we need to think about uh, well beyond WPS, but other spaces is where feminist knowledge practices need uh, footholds, uh, perhaps as we've seen in, in security sector. Thanks, also thanks for picking up the, the question uh, from the audience and integrating this. Uh, Helen, would you like to, um, yeah, uh, think about a few of the questions raised? Helen? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Um, I was just also going through the, the some of those questions. I don't know which in particular you would like me to uh, to address. Maybe this issue of um, sexual violence and the Istanbul Convention um, um, and uh, the political support for gender issues uh, within security um, or just promoting um, gender justice outside uh, outside the EU. I think that it's a bit disturbing and disappointing um, that you know the global women's movement you know have made a lot of efforts you know to highlight uh, the impact of militarization on women, the intercession and the, you know, or how um, weapons and um, war uh, used during wars and illicit um, arms flow actually contributes to increased uh, sexual violence in, in conflict and post-conflict situations. Um, and the fact that these armament processes are also not very detailed or transformative in, in that sense, uh, that long after conflict, we still find these weapons are available and they are being used uh, for intimidation, both during and after conflict. They are being used to intimidate and threaten women um, and then perpetuating gender-based violence and particularly uh, sexual violence uh, and other forms of human rights violations. Um, you know, uh, both within the, the, the individual households and in the communities, but also at national level. And a good example would be the, 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 the COVID crisis, um, where we find that during the crisis, the approach that was adopted, you know, to constrain the spread of the disease was militaristic in nature you know, where people are forced to remain at home, the police was deployed to enforce uh, these this methods uh, and uh, locking up people in homes where, you know, they are being raped, beaten, uh, some things around um, social norms around sexual violence as well, 
we had relatives are the ones who raped. Um, uh, and um, in Uganda, for example, we got a high number of girls who were raped and who are pregnant and who are going to drop out of school. The fact that this continuum of violence in any crisis situation, or the fact that in any crisis situation, sexual violence is being used on women, you know, demands that we continuously interrogate why is it, you know, you know, like the question said, why is it that despite all of this effort, it continues? It's because, you know, in these situations, um, no one is paying attention to justice for, for, for survivors, and no one is calling for accountability of perpetrators. So we have people, violated girls and women, and they're still living in the same community. The justice, there's no enough investment to strengthen the justice system to enable women to, to be able to obtain justice. And so, so if we don't link these, these issues around the security, sec security sector reform, the justice law and other sector reforms, and relate them to these issues, then we're not going to be able to get anything. So where you have a, a foreign policy that is looking at uh, increasing funding to military approaches, um, then you begin to say, what is the purpose in the first place and for who? Does it benefit? And has these policies that promote military approaches, have they really interrogated the impact of these on sexual violence, on economic violations uh, for civilians during conflict and particularly women? Have they really looked at the impact on health um, access for women, on education for women, and, and how this can actually uh, be overlooked, but becomes a major problem, you know, in the post-conflict phase of this conflict. That you're going to have a lot of women who are not in school, who could not access health services and then die as a result of that. That women also are confronted with a lot of care work that they actually don't think about the peace process or participating in it. So I think that generally, if we do not look at this in a holistic way, and looking at the intersectionality of these issues, but also looking at the different categories of women, you know, young women, uh, middle-aged women, old women, LGBTIQs, uh, women living with disabilities, those who were disabled as a result of the conflict, and how all of this is impacting on them, you know, then we are just um, not addressing the main issues. So I, 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 I just also wanted to mention that the fact that paying attention to military approach only increases the expenditure on, on, on weapons and military spending on the part of countries that are in conflict because there's a ready market uh, and they really want to use that approach. But then what happens to addressing unemployment, addressing marginalization, addressing the economic impact of conflict, you know, and how um, taking these resources into buying arms and weapons affect these other aspects that should actually be taken care of uh, during conflicts. Uh, and how, for me, and maybe the other panelists will help me, this also has to do with issues of masculinity and ego, definition of what peace is, definition, you know, um, and imagining that a military approach can deliver peace. You know, it's like, where does that form of thinking come from other, other than economic benefits of selling weapons, you know, not paying attention to the real issues on the ground, but also supporting themselves as, as men in the club of, of, of leadership. But the question I always ask myself is, would it be different if it was women, you know, who were in the spaces, if they were feminists who were in the spaces? Um, because what we have also learned over time is having one woman speak from a feminist perspective within a majority of mainstream men it's difficult to break through the practices, the systems, because they're so patriarchal and one person cannot do it. So how do we ensure that, you know, what Laura was saying, the voices, the right voices are, are there at the table to interrogate these practices, you know, to be able to, to, to protect human rights violations during conflict, to hold states accountable, but also to be able to help them to develop strategies that can uh, protect women from, uh, violence, prevent conflict, and build more sustainable peace. 
Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, this is, um, yeah, th thanks for this uh, reflection on the role of the, the military and militarism. And this uh, brings me to ask Laura a bit more about the use um, focus um, on military means more recently. Um, and uh, I think we have witnessed also that the youth very much focused on security sector reform. Uh, and um, specifically, we wanted to think about the role of the European peace facility uh, with the, well, peace in its name, but it's actually new funding instruments for EU military operations. But it's also in what's most kind of contested, it's, it's also su supposed or it will allow for, for the EU to finance military equipment. Um, and this includes arms. Um, for non-EU uh, actors. So I would like uh, Laura to, to um, tell us a little bit about what she thinks, how this European peace facility um, will contribute or not contribute to feminist peace uh, building and also what this means in connection to the US commitment to the WPS agenda. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Hannah. And you know, I'd really like to sort of continue if I may from where Helen left off where which is this idea that basically um, your the size of your guns um, is a measure of your standing in the world and unfortunately this seems to be very much the way the EU has it has been going for some time but this has accelerated um, and I find this particularly puzzling one because as Helen's just said we all know that the least effective way of resolving conflict is through the use of, of lethal force it just doesn't work. I mean, you can't, if if an army the size and the professionalism of the British army can't pacify a, a, a place the size of Northern Ireland, I mean, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And secondly, we know that the, the EU strength in the world is the power of persuasion, soft power, trade, all of that. That's its power. Now you can contest normative powers, Europe, you can test all of these things, but that is where it's civilian power Europe, but that's where its power lies, right? So oddly, the EPF is an attempt to marry the EU's weakest aspect with the worst possible way of trying to resolve conflict. So then we come back to the question of what it's for. And I'd, sadly, I think the answer is in the global strategy where it talks about supporting the defense communities. That's what we know of as the arms trade. It's not a defense community, it's an arms trade for export. So sadly, that I think is the answer. I don't think the EPF is gonna work. I have colleagues who are less optimistic than me. Um, I do think it's gonna waste a huge amount of money um, and uh, money that's in short supply and could be an awful, use an awful lot better. It has all been, it's been set up, but they haven't worked out how they're going to do their safeguarding, how they are going to make sure that the weapons, they provide perfectly happy to provide lethal force, but that actually that these are going to be used in a, in a good way. And if we look at the history of you know, DDR programs, of SSR programs, only say in sub-Saharan Africa, only in this part of the world, those, those, those efforts have not been successful. Um, if we look at what's happened when elite forces of armies have been trained by the Americans, by the British, by the Europeans to go and do something for something else, like to go and fight in Somalia, or to, uh, to go and do something else as part of a peacekeeping mission and they go back home, then they are routinely uh, associated with human rights violations. So record, frankly, isn't good. History looks extremely poor. So the only answer you can see for it is to support the arms trade, which means that we as European taxpayers should be doing something about this because obviously unemployment is a problem, but the, you know, taking the taking one one business out of uh, Western Europe and replacing it with something else, that should be a strategy that we should all be advocating for, we should all be lobbying for, and we should all be pointing out that, you know, a job is not worth a life. So um, that's on the, the peace facility, but that is one small part of the, the problem. The other part of the problem I see with the peace facility is exactly uh, Helen's point, which is, reinforces this narrative of you have to be armed. You have to be armed in order to be taken seriously. And I've heard this said um, about, uh, you know, for various uh, places that, oh, well, you know, we as Europe, we're not taken seriously because, you know, the Russians are there and the Russians have got arms. I mean, if we're having an arms race with the Russians to get to the peace negotiation table, then I think we really need to be rethinking about what European foreign policy is or might be. Um, now, the, um, and part of this, and I think 
I think this is also something we need to be more aware of in Europe as well, is this whole, um, the whole uh, narrative of the efficiency and effectiveness of military of the military in general. So one of the things, I mean, I must say, you know, I'm commenting on Europe, but I'm sitting rather far away. But as I see it, is that um, the fact that now uh, COVID vaccines, for example, are being administered by the army, this is something that we should be worried about because it reinforces the notion that we need to have, as Europeans, a standing army, which is basically there to do something effectively and efficiently. There is no reason to have an airman or a, a, a submarine pilot or whoever it is who's doing these vaccines. We don't need them to be delivering vaccines. These can be done by civilians and they should be done by civilians because that's not the role of a military. So on the one hand, we have this push to find jobs for, for the arms industry abroad. On the other hand, we're trying to find jobs for the soldiers at home, because, of course, these soldiers are not the ones who are going to be fighting with the EPF, because the Europeans don't send men into combat zones. They outsource that. And, you know, I think the expression here in Uganda, and Helen will correct me, is that, you know, it's, um, it's European money and African blood. So, you know, all of this, frankly, stinks. The, 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 the narrative on it is absolutely horrible and we need to draw, we need to talk about this because it, it's too often hushed up, it's too often uh, pushed under the carpet and say, oh, well, you know, you don't understand, this is the real world, this is realism. No, it's not. It's, this is, it doesn't have to be, but we do need to talk about it We need no, and draw attention to it. Um, now, without, uh, you know, going too much, again, with, as, as you mentioned, Hannah, in your, um, in your transition just then, that the, the um, the, it, this, the, the EPF is only part of this, uh, and the EU has been increasing its support uh, significantly to security sector reform and also for capacity building within the security forces um, across the world. And separate from this general concern of mine about um, uh, militarization, again, it's, I think a lot of this is also a perversion of what I understand the spirit of WPS to be, um, which is actually not to make women safer in conflict, it's to make everybody safe, right? In other words, stop the conflict. Um, so this notion that somehow by, you know, tinkering with it, making, of course, if you are going to, in the, in the European peace and security architecture, of course, it should be staffed 50% women. But the notion, as, ha as Helen mentioned, the notion that you put women into an institution, particularly a security institution, and that this somehow transforms it, that these women are able to, com to completely transform just by sheer force of character, the entire systems and structures around them, that suddenly it becomes a feminist force for good in the world, is just ludicrous. Now, I lived for three years, very close to the Israeli army and whatever else is true of the Israeli army it has an awful lot of women in it and whatever else is true of the Israeli army it can't be said to be kind and it can't be said to be feminist right so all of this notion about increasing the number of women in in in, in armies for me that's a human resources question and it's entirely separate from what these architecture and what these resources and what these money and what these weapons are supposed to do and that is where we need a feminist foreign policy because as Gina pointed out right from the start this is where WPS falls down, because WPS, to my view, has been taken over to, by too large a part by people who believe there is a role for the military uh, in a feminist foreign policy. And I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't understand it. And I don't see how it can be. I can see in my, my understanding, and there's many feminist foreign policies, very many feminist peace building thought. I appreciate all of that. But in my understanding of it, the only role I can foresee for armed intervention is the narrowest of peacekeeping missions, literally keeping people apart so that there is some space to breathe and some space to talk. But the narrowest of peacekeeping missions, not the peace, the mission creep that we've seen over the last decades. That I could concede is probably important for peace building. I know others disagree, but if that's, uh, that is my, my view and my, my, um, my personal view on this. So, what then do we need to do? I think that as feminists, the, it's a dark, it's quite a dark time in Europe in many ways. I also think though, that these conversations seem to be gaining traction. We, there seem to be much more of these conversations uh, in Europe about Europe's place in the world, about the role for feminists in Europe. And this is what I think we should be doing. I think we should be calling out this we, um, and building alliances, building alliances across, uh, particularly across the green and the other progressive movements, because all of these, there's a question in the, the chat, which I, I can't re reply to with any, in any detail, but I don't see there is any difference 
um, in you know with the with the, the the feminist climate crisis activists, the feminist peace builders that we are natural allies. I would have thought. Uh, so we need to be building coalitions. Super. Thank you, Laura, for um, bringing yeah to to raising the importance of the moment as well and the recent developments we see in Europe, but also elsewhere. Um, to really um, push uh, feminist peace or feminist foreign policy, if we want to use this, this idea. Um, also looking at the time, uh, I think we would have so much more to discuss, but I would like to um, give also Gina and, and, and Helen, but actually also, yeah, also Laura, if there's something you, you want to add the, the space to, to maybe add or have some final words or, or express a wish uh, or whatever you like. Um, to, to, to kind of conclude this, this really good discussion. Um, Gina, do you, do you have uh, any, any final remarks? Thanks, Hannah. Um, so just looking at my notes from before I came, the, or the one that sort of as a closing is thinking about local feminist networks as experts. I think I mentioned it before, um, but you know, we discussed before we came on, you know, we're talking about Israel, what's going on in, terms of um, violence in Israel-Palestine at the moment. Um, and for me, the starting point is then is what are the Palestinian feminists saying? What are the, you know, what are women in black saying? What are the local networks, uh, feminist networks saying to inform? Uh, otherwise we're replicating some of the things that we're perhaps critiquing uh, here as well. Um, but maybe just also thinking, and you know, I've been in other spaces where COVID has been articulated as a moment for change and community building. Um, and I think there is space for transnational feminist practices to remind the world of that and actually remind the world of the kind of unique shape of feminist transnational dialogues, which are diverse. They're not necessarily in agree agreement with each other, but they do already have existing networks that don't necessarily require the state or the nation and can think about different kinds of problems like, you know, a global public health problem. Um, and sort of echoing what Laura said, why, why would we think a, a military could solve that? Either we have to redefine what a military is, um, but, you know, just emphasizing the kind of existence of feminist transnational networks and what they do and using them as spaces to find experts as opposed to, oh, well, you know, you could be a spokeswoman for people in your region, but actually saying these are the experts on how we think about feminist peace or, or global peace and, and justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Do you, would you like to add a few words? Yeah, I think that I would recommend that um, the EU should review this current military approach to peace building um, or to security and development and consider developing uh, disarmament and arms control policies uh, that incorporate a gender perspective. You know, we, we're looking at what can we do next. Um, and also, I think it's time, like Laura is saying, that the EU holds a, a, a self-reflection on the extent to which their, their support to peace building has translated to improved safety for women uh, as required by the WPS. So you can't have a policy uh, that actually is against some of the principles of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And I think this analysis, self-analysis would enable, you know, to give information in terms of what future engagements should look like. You know, um, so and I think it's also a, a, a um, uh, an accountability approach. You know, you can't be doing something without then reporting on how these resources are being used, um, particularly by taxpayers. You know, in terms of your impact and what you claim to be uh, promoting. And, and 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 I would just leave with these words to say that if there are countries uh, within the EU who uh, export arms who deploy troops, you know, like Laura was saying, that sometimes even these things are outsourced, and also who maintain military bases uh, or have foreign policies that promote militarization, you're contributing to the global conflict that we're experiencing. You're part of the conflict that we're experiencing. You're, you're part of uh, those who are perpetuating human rights violations against citizens, you know, in, in conflict countries. So even if you think that you don't have wars in your countries, you're actually contributing to wars. Uh, and I think that we need to find ways to hold such countries accountable to you know, such uh, huge 
human rights violations and uh, find ways for them to, to begin to pay for such, for such uh, violations of human rights. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for such clear final words. Laura, do you have some final words as well? So I think um, for me, I'd like to reiterate the point that's been made that peace building is only peace building if it's feminist peace building. Otherwise it's simply reinforcing patterns of exclusion or creating new ones. And that, that is what inequality fuels violence and conflict. And those aren't stopped by guns and they aren't stopped by borders. Right. And something that the European Union as an international actor and something as European and international NGOs and other external actors need to understand is that, and also that even environments that seem stable on the outside are not necessarily stable for everybody. And that particularly women and particularly LGBTIQ human rights defenders and peace builders are maybe at severe risk, even in so-called stable environments. And that it is our responsibility as peace builders to ensure that they as are uh, safe as well, because I think the bottom line of it is, and that this is something that seems to be lost, is that this isn't something that's projected or done to other people. It can only be working together to help other people resolve their problems in understanding that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that by projecting force and by projecting and reinforcing uh, areas of inequality, exactly as Helen says, is that actually this is only fueling conflict and only fueling violence. And so the EU, EU couldn't possibly call itself a peace builder under those circumstances. Thanks so much. Um, I am very grateful to all of you for this really nice uh, conversation. Um, and I'm also very, very thankful that people were sticking around in the audience, even though we are running a bit, a bit late. But I think this, um, yeah, th there would have been so much more to, to discuss. Um, also, yeah, about the, the, the recent uh, developments uh, in the EU. Um, and, and this, uh, yeah, problematic roles of, of um, emphasizing militarism, et cetera. But uh, I'm happy we, we've, we ended the discussion uh, with raising these important questions. So thank you very much to, to all three of you for, for your contributions, for your engagement. That was really excellent. Um, and thank you to the audience for engaging with questions um, uh, uh, in our um, debate um, and for being with us uh, today. And um, also, um, I would like to, to thank everyone who's followed the series that I've organized with Pola, Tsiwulak and Lara Talsma, um, as this is kind of the end of, of our little series on the feminist EU in the world with a big question mark. Um, I guess the question mark is bigger than, than ever. Um, and it's really been a treat to, to, to engage with all our speakers. And I would also like to draw your attention uh, to another event that's coming up on uh, a slightly different topic, but yet connected, I think. Neoliberalism's Fool to Anti-Feminism. It's on the 27th of May, um, organized by, um, amongst others, my colleague, Kali Rocheband. Um, so you can find that also on our website. Thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, have a good day and take care. Mm -hmm.